Um, so I'm Xavier Amatrian from Quora and Justin Basiligo from Netflix. And when we saw this call for papers on past, present, and future, we said we need to submit something here. I've been involved in this conference since the first one in Minnesota. Justin has a highly cited paper all the way back to 2004. So we've been on this for a while. And we obviously, for those that don't know, we met at Netflix. So we both worked at Netflix. I'm now at Quora. And Netflix has been very connected to the past, also the present, of recommender systems. And hopefully, Quora will also be connected to the future of recommender systems. So we're going to give an industry perspective on this past, present, and future. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Justin, who's going to get started with the past. Thanks, Chevy. Um, so to get started, let's jump in our time machine and rev it up to 88 miles per hour and uh, take a little visit back to the past back to 2006, which was the time the conference started and was also happens to be the time that the Netflix Prize was launched. And I think the Netflix Prize kind of uh, demonstrates kind of what was the state of the art at the time back then, which is a lot about rating prediction, RMSC optimization. Um, and the Netflix Prize was great for Netflix. It was well worth the, the investment of a million dollars that we put into it because it really sparked a whole amazing amount of work. Um, there's great papers you can go and read uh, about that and really kind of helped accelerate the uh, innovation over the past 10 years. But let's not linger in the past too long. Let's jump uh, forward into the present. Um, so now recommendation systems and industry have really gone uh, very mainstream and they're really core parts of a lot of the products that people use across the world every day. So um, they're used pervasively in, in various media companies, um, you know, all the way from you know, YouTube to Amazon, Spotify, Pandora, uh, Netflix. Um, and while in this talk, we'll talk a lot about Netflix and, and Quora because those are the ones we're familiar with, uh, but we're trying to represent kind of insights we have from the industry in general. Um, so uh, recommendation systems are not just used in media, but also in a lot of places like uh, that do news and uh, social networks and so on. Um, and they just help people find uh, great content uh, and, and people there as well. So in the present recommendation systems, things have really moved beyond just using um, explicit feedback and ratings and um, into the, the case of mostly using implicit feedback. And the reason for this is that applications are really typically oriented around some kind of action, what people are going to click on, what they're going to buy, listen to, read, or watch. Um, and the reason that implicit feedback is great is that um, it get, we get more of it um, as part of normal use, and we get better data because it's typically more aligned with what people uh, actually uh, are going to do and the actions we're trying to predict. Um, and along the way, we've learned to augment the implicit information with uh, contextual information as well as content for cold start and build hybrid models where we put them all together. OK, so another thing we've talked about, and it's really relevant in the present, is this uh, sort of move from rating prediction to ranking. And ranking, ranking items is central for recommender systems. I hope that we've convinced you over the past few years, and a lot of you are working on that. And at the end of the day, whatever you do, whatever model, you're going to have to, most of the time, select the list, and you're going to have to rank it. And uh, we've actually used this diagram here in the past to talk about a way to approach uh, or to understand ranking. And if you had rating prediction on one axis and popularity on another, you can build a linear model that is the weighted combination of those two things. And there you go. You have a learning to rank approach uh, for personalized uh, recommendations. The interesting thing with doing that is that now you've turned your problem into first a learning to rank problem with all the ranking metrics, secondly into a feature engineering problem because now you can throw in as many features as you want. Of course, you can't, you don't have to stop at two. You can throw hundreds of features and you can improve your recommender system. So that's something a lot of people are doing in the present. Uh, and the other thing that many products and many industries are doing is treating everything as a recommendation, right? So if you look at the Quora application, you'll realize that we not only have a Quora recommender system, there's like dozens of different algorithms and recommendations interacting with each other. Uh, so you'll, you'll get your homepage feed, you'll get similar items that are recommended when you're doing something, you'll get users that are recommended to you, you'll get uh, topics that are recommended, same thing for Netflix, you'll get uh, rows, you'll get ranking within rows. So everything you see is personalized and is part of a recommender system. Okay, so this is the present. Net, let's try to look a little bit about uh, on, onto the future. So first, let's say that there's a ton of things that we could be uh, talking about here in the future, and 
uh, like deep learning. There's the, a parallel session talking about deep learning. But we're going to focus on these four things on the left, because we think that they're kind of unique, and we can offer a unique perspective on them from uh, industry. Uh, the first one is indirect feedback. And that's something that we are starting to hear more and more, but we think there's more research that is needed here. So the idea is um, users only click or perform an action on whatever we show, we show them. And that really poses a lot of problems in, and when you're building a recommender system. Uh, the main problem is that what they click on and what you show is actually already the result of your recommendation. So it's actually biased towards that. So you're getting only positive feedback on what you're already predicting that it's good. And you don't have counterfactuals. And really, you don't have negatives. And of course, we hack our way around that. And there are ways that we can uh, build things that are starting to sort of be um, heard of or uh, presented here in the conference, like attention models, uh, using context as a way of implicit feedback, and all the explore explore approaches, which I would like to actually see more research going into. Another thing going into the future uh, that we think is really interesting is this idea of value-aware recommendations. So we're still very fixated on predicting the probability of the user doing something. But the reality is that given a similar probability, not even the exact same probability, a similar probability of the user taking an action or an item, there are items that have more value than others. And there's little work on, in research uh, being done around that. And there's a lot of use in industry. Um, be, for, just to give you an example, I mean, in e-commerce, there's obviously different items that are going to have different ma margin. And if the probability that the user likes them and clicks on them and buys them is the same, should you recommend one or the other? Uh, but not only about margin and making money, right? It's like it's the quality of the content or long-term versus short-term retention. As a matter of fact, this is a very important thing for avoiding clickbait. There are things that are going to have even higher probability of being action on, but the value they bring to your system long-term is actually lower, and you want to avoid them. So how to put this into your system? We're basically hacking our way around it. Uh, in the case of Quora and many other companies, by the way, this is the same thing that LinkedIn does, it's the same thing that Facebook does. What we do is we build this objective function as a sum of the value we give to actions, and then we optimize our model to that. But I would like to see sort of like better models to do this and better ways to input that into our algorithms. I think it's a very interesting uh, approach. And then an extreme uh, version of this is using value as a way to infer things that don't even exist, right? So Netflix wants to infer the value of shows that don't even exist to create them. And Quora wants to know the value of questions and answers that we don't have so we can actually put the mechanisms in place so that people create that content. And this same idea of like how to throw in the value or the reward in the different items into our recommendation systems is something that uh, we would like to see more research going into. On to Justin. So another area that um, we've started some work and there's been getting to be a little bit of work in the community, but we'd like to see a lot more of is that of doing full page optimization. So not just thinking of you know, individual items or in individual rankings being created, but thinking about the recommendations as a whole set of of things that you're trying to recommend and place together on a page that might be filled with other non-recommendation elements that you want to take into account when you're putting things together. So we'd like to be able to do this as a joint optimization problem over the entire page um, and, uh, and basically figure out what set of items and where to put them all together along with explanations uh, and supporting evidence. Um, and we have to do this, of course, also when you build a whole page, you can't kind of kick the can down the road of important things like diversity, freshness, exploration, being able to help people find things no matter what's in your catalog and handling all the non-recommendation elements that work there. And I think this is also a way of kind of bridging some of the gap between you know, kind of algorithmic work and, and the user experience um, and, and making them work more hand in hand. Going a little bit further, we also think about uh, in the future trying to personalize more how we recommend um, and not just what we recommend. So uh, we do, can think about doing this on the algorithm level where there's beginning to be a bit of work on finding you know, that there's different balances of things like novelty, diversity, popularity, and freshness among different people. And a lot of time when you get feedback on a recommendation system, you can kind of interpret that as potentially your model's wrong, but also potentially it's a, an aspect to personalize along. Um, and then going a little further, you can think of taking this up to the display level, 
of, of personalizing you know, how you show the items and how you present the recommendations to the user and sh by showing them the information that's gonna make it easiest for them to choose uh, whether or not they wanna accept this recommendation. So it can make it even easier for them to find uh, uh, the, the thing that they want. And kind of even a step further is to think about doing this at an interaction level and personalizing the needs of you know, the power user who wants all types of features um, and things to interact with very you know, carefully with their recommendation system, have a lot of control over it, with the more typical lean back user who just wants to you know, have things work and not worry about having a lot of uh, different steps to have to go through in the user interface. And a certain example of, of what this could look like is here's you know, a typical Netflix page as it looks now. You know, right now we've talked a little about ranking in rows and sort of maybe trying to do that as big page optimization. But we think, think about going further of, is this actually the best you know, evidence row title for the person, the right metadata, the right evidence for the video, the right synopsis? Maybe we could get someone more interested if a different text. Is that predicted rating actually useful for this user? What about these big images? Is that the most you know, enticing and most representative images we use for the, uh, you know, kind of the horizontal and higher images? So we can look at the whole you know, screen of everything we show and the content we're showing as a potential uh, surface for doing personalization. Um, so to conclude, um, if you look back 10 years, things have changed a lot in the recommendation systems community and we've kind of gone a long way. I'm really looking forward to the next 10. I know we both are. And I think we've gotten, uh, uh, you know, we've gotten here because industry and academia have been working together um, to kind of push the uh, state of the art since the beginning. And we want to make sure that that continues. Um, and that way we can continue to delight all the people who use these products all over the world. And with that, thank you. Great timing, guys, and an awful lot of content in 12 minutes. Um, have we got questions? Hi. Uh, so you mentioned that, you Umberto, know. Umberto, can you introduce Umberto yourself? from uh, Zalando. Um, you mentioned that you it's is, very important. Who is you? Sorry? Who is you? I'm Umberto from Zalando. No, no. You said you mentioned. <laughs> Both, of, sorry, okay. both of you. Okay. You both mentioned, or sorry, Justin mentioned at the end that the collaboration between industry and academia is very important for the future of the of the field, right? And and I wonder how do you think that collaboration can be better? Because I think year after year we're having a lot of papers from the academia that focus on certain areas that maybe are not so relevant for industry, and it's harder for people in the academia to solve problems that are still relevant for, for the industry because we just don't have the data, right? So how do you think we can solve those shortfalls and come into the future? How do you think we can collaborate better? Do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think um, this conference is an example of pretty good collaboration. If you look around, there's a lot of papers, even in the regular track that come from industry, a lot of them come from academia. There's an industry track. There's a lot of sort of cross-pollination between uh, academia and industry. You are right that um, the Netflix Prize, one of the great things that it had is that it released a data set that was very useful for academia. And that's something that we kind of lack a little bit. But um, you do have things like Kaggle, where um, you get different data sets, like the Criteo data set was released not long ago. And you have different data sets that are, have different aspects. And you also have a lot of collaboration from people going into industry and doing internships and learning about the real problems, then going back and applying them in uh, their company. So that's, sorry, in their uh, PhD. So that's something that I think uh, those, all those mechanisms are in place. We just need to use them better. But this conference in particular, uh, and I go to many, I think it's a good example of like really good collaboration between industry and academia. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just if you go to different conferences, the fact that there's you know, actually an industry track that we're actually up here talking about the problems that we have. You know, we're sharing kind of what we see as the, what, what we need and think is going to happen in the future. So uh, that kind of, and then being able to share and learn about what's going on in academia on, on these problems, I think, is, is great. And so I think it's healthy and can to kind of have both sides here and, and kind of uh, working together. Uh, okay, Peter, Peter. Peter, Peter Brusilovsky, University of Pittsburgh. Stand up. It's very hard with all of this equipment. Okay, guys, I just want to say it's a great talk, but I'm scared. 
I mean, I'm not as scared as a researcher, I'm scared as a faculty who is teaching students, specifically master's students who would like to go to professional life. We kind of spend a lot of efforts to create recommender system courses, and it looks like we're now teaching all wrong. Do I have any message? What we should change? I mean, there are two textbooks, right, for recommender system, but it's not exactly what you're talking about here, right? It's all new stuff. Should we basically teach the same thing as we used to teach, and you get them as interns and retrain them? <laughs> or maybe should we change the way we're teaching personalization recommender system just to students to get more prepared to Netflix, Quora, and other kind of places? Uh, that's a <laughs> great, uh, great question, Peter. Um, but uh, I think uh, that's true for anything in technology nowadays, right? If you look at machine learning, it's like the same thing. Courses are just like struggling to keep up, and they weren't talking about deep learning just two years ago, and now they're obsolete, and they have to redo their whole thing just to include deep learning. So I think, uh, yes, the pace of technology moves really fast, and uh, you, you're never going to be sort of like, and, and by the way, we were talking about the future here, so I think it's trying to nudge professors and people in academia in that direction, <laughs> but we don't expect people to go out from their uh, regular undergrad knowing all of this and knowing how to solve it, right? So I think it's more of research uh, aspects. Thanks, yeah. guys. I might get you to leave it there. I think most of the room is leaving with pictures of that slide, um, <laughs> and it will hopefully be circulated. <laughs>